Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and in this video, we're gonna be reviewing Pandemonium Anabasios Ninth Circle on the Savage Difficulty or P9S for short. Now, before we go any further, I wanna say this, in case you were wondering, I'm not doing any guides for the current Savage tier. I decided this a while ago, strictly because of its proximity to Final Fantasy 16. I'm still working on my count up, which is me playing through a bunch of Final Fantasy games before 16 comes out. We're expecting a demo sometime in the next week. I wanted to make some time for Devil May Cry 5. I'm going to Los Angeles for the live event. And so I just decided that trying to cram in a guide after after however many days or hours I was working on this was just not going to be feasible this time. That being said, I love just talking about fights and fight design, and I like to use this opportunity to talk about how we handle thing in, things in a prog environment, how we looked at mechanics, how we saw them, how we misread them. So consider this more of a lesson of the prog environment, of learning a fight without a resource, and ways that you can actually improve looking at an encounter and trying to solve exactly what you're supposed to do. So we're gonna be just doing that for this fight and all the other fights as well as individual videos, so it's almost like a long form guide for those who want to understand something a little deeper. With that being said, I think we should probably get started because while the video is 10 minutes long, the one that we're watching, we're very likely going to be here for much longer than that. So first of all, these markers, we just set down standard markers around this middle circle. Um, because of the, some of the mechanics in the very first part, uh, we just landed on these and quite frankly, never changed them. Um, I don't know if anyone uses different markers for these, but this, these are like, these are what I consider standard prog markers. You usually decide where is A and one going and then you just go through, you know, 2B, 3C, 4D clockwise. Our group was a one Northwest kind of group. And uh, yeah, we fought about that. And you'll probably fight about that with other groups. But yeah, these markers are just like generic standout, you know, whatever. And believe it or not, this fight begins with two autos and an AOE followed by an auto, two autos, I should say, and then a tank buster. <laughs> oh no, it actually, it's right. It actually doesn't do the tank buster until after Ravening. I don't remember after all the P12S that I've done. So the main mechanic in P9S is Ravening. The boss eats a soul and then does mechanics based on the souls that it eats. It's not random at all. The order of the souls is always exactly the same. So you don't have to worry about that aspect of it. The Ravening cast does do a bunch of damage though. So you do need to make sure to have mitt and heal. With gear, this will become easier and easier. Now, the first one is always mage. And this is the most like normal mode section. Probably the most, probably the section that most people predicted closely enough for Savage itself. You know, like people say like, oh, well it does, the boss does this in normal, so it's probably gonna do this in Savage. That's pretty much what this phase is. Now, right after Ravening, there is a tank buster, which is just the tanks need to swap. They both take a hit on each cast. And it's just, it's basically one fire, one wind tank buster, and then it swaps on the tanks because you get uh, resistance down to the same element. So that's all there is to that. There's nothing fancy, nothing, nothing unique or whatever to say about that. We do keep the swaps. Sometimes groups uh, swap back. Actually, we, we did swap back there. I saw it. It was just, they got into position. The big thing here is dual spell. There's four, uh, I'm sorry, there's three different dual spells that go out here and they have specific types of combinations that you can run into. The first one is always fire and ice. And then it's either one of two scenarios. Either the boss will pulse fire or pulse ice. Now this just does exactly what it did in normal mode, but without any AOE indicators. And that's what the circle in the arenas are, the circles around the arena are for. The very inside of the boss's hitbox is where the ices can shrink to, like in normal mode. And then the outer circle is the normal size of the ice AOE. The fires are either small or large. I mean, honestly, if you did normal mode, you completely understand how, how dual spell works. So basically what you wanna do for this first one is stand with a partner because you're always gonna be doing a two person split damage AOE. So DPS pair up with tanks and healers, it's really simple. Then one of two things will pulse, either the fire or the ice. If the fire pulses, it means that the fire AOEs are enormous, but the ice AOE is the really big donut at the same time. So this fire pulsing just means all the pairs run out. You wanna make sure you don't run too close or even past this outer line right here that you see on the arena, because that is the size of the ice AOE. So we just ran, you know, just right to the front of our markers approximately, maybe another step back. And then bam, you can see the AOEs reach, uh, you can briefly see the circle reaching to right about here. So really in no threat of one another, everyone gets magic vuln, so you can't do any sort of fanciness with this either. 
Uh, so, yeah, nothing to that. If it was ice, on the other hand, though, we would have stayed in the starting position that we have here. And we, then it, that's it. We're done. Like, that's the whole reason why we're in this spot is because ice just automatically resolves from that spot in that case. Funnily enough, I, I don't even know if the healer there needed to move back. I think they might have been safe from the other AoEs in the ice position. It might just need to be... Oh, yeah, but the problem is you don't know which of the two is going to get it. Yeah, 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 because it could either be all four supports getting it or all four DPS. It's kind of like, uh, like the meteors in... Uh, Warrior of Light. So yeah, you do both need to move out. That's just a case where I got it and they technically could have stayed. Now the second dual spell is going to be actually something brand new. It's Lightning and Ice. So if the Lightning pulses, it means that the Lightning AoE is enhanced and if the Ice pulses, it's the same as the first one. Lightning is just four line AoEs. One, I'm sorry, it's just uh, line AoEs aimed at all eight players. So it's, uh, as we like to call that in the raiding community, we call that Proteans. As you may be more familiar with it, Clock Spots, both of those actually work as callouts. So we go to our designated Clock Spots. This is the Lightning Pulse. So what changes with the Lightning Pulse is that the AoEs that the lightning that the lightning does become much wider. So it's exactly like a Fire Pulse. Everyone just needs to go out. So you'll see we go out because the lightning pulsed, and then you can see the size of the lightning AoEs is just absolutely enormous. If it was ice that was pulsing, we'd have stayed in our spots, and then these lines would be much smaller, and we'd just be safe. You know, nothing, nothing fancy there. And then the last dual spell is Fire and Ice again, but it's always the reverse of the first one. Or at least we, unless we're getting Final Fantasy, we always saw the reverse of the first one. I would just call it out every time and it was never wrong. So unless we got super confirmation biased, then this will be whatever pattern you didn't do on the first dual spell. So it's Fire and Ice, and then that's what the small one looks like. We literally just stand still. <laughs> it's like, yep, here we are, and bam. That's what it looks like if it pulses ice. And that's literally the boss is already missing over 20% of their health. Like the, this fight goes really, really fast. And that's because of the 50% mechanic that we're going to get to uh, just a little bit later. After that, boss is going to unravening. And then I believe re-ravening um, after a few seconds. I think it's like two autos and then ravening again. So two, yep, two autos and ravening again. Another raid wide. This is going to be the Marshalist, which is also from normal mode. And a lot of these mechanics are very quick to identify. So the first thing you'll notice is that there's four walls. These walls will either all be on the Cardinals, North, South, East, and West, or the Inter Cardinals, North, East, South, East, Southwest, Northwest. Um, all you have to do is make sure that those same pairs that you were using for the fire buddies in the first mechanic, uh, that they go together into these spots. We actually do it in such a way where if it's Cardinals, the DPS rotate clockwise. If it's Intercardinals, then the supports rotate clockwise. I don't know what the PF does. Uh, what's very common in other parties and in Party Finder is that uh, these markers that are laid around the room, we have them next to each other in terms of color. So like one and A are the same color, so they're next to each other. Two and A are, two and B are the same color, so they're next to each other. Um, what a lot of people will do for mechanics like this instead is they'll do color buddies where no matter where it ends up, like if it was intercardinal, then the A marked player would come to me. And if it was cardinal, I'm the one marked player, I'd go to A. And you do that between all the different color buddies, 2B, 3C, and 4D. That's very common. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's how it's handled, but I'm telling you that's what we did. We didn't do color buddies. We did just DPS rotate clockwise or supports rotate clockwise. Nothing fancy there. There is a single target tank buster here that requires a swap. So... You know, that's worth bearing in mind. It hits hard and just needs a swap. But other than that, it's not like it's you know, anything too fancy. So uh, the next thing here is actually just more more normal mode stuff. Like, honestly, a lot of this stuff is, is very reminiscent of normal. But the damage and the punishment for doing it wrong is so severely amped up. So this is the knockback from normal. And the point is you're going to get knocked into those walls and then also take a split damage AOE. And it's the same, it's either gonna target all four supports or all four DPS. So you break up into you know support DPS pairs like you see me doing with the tank here. You take the knockback, you go into the wall, and then bam, this is the AOE going off. You can see everyone with the magic vault. Then the boss does one of four different attacks. It will either do a donut or a point blank AOE, or, and in addition to that, it will do either front combination or rear combination. Again, these are all in normal mode. They're not new, but there is something a little bit different about it. The big thing here is the timing that is allowed. So at the same time, all of these 
uh, these like earth, I guess fissures. Yeah, the, these earth fissures are like pulsing. You can see right here when these reach the end point of their fissure, it explodes in a giant AOE. You do briefly see the AOE, so you can see it right here. And there's two different safe spots on the arena. One's gonna usually they're just opposite of each other. They can be east west. They can be northeast southwest. Whatever. The idea is no matter what, you need to dodge this then dodge the front or back AOE that's going to come out of the boss, and then dodge whatever the boss didn't do first. So for example, here, the boss is doing point blank front combination. That means that after the point blank, the boss is going to do a 180 degree AOE in front of him. So you need to be mindful of the direction he's facing as well. And then after that is actually going to be a donut because the boss did a point blank first, so it ends with a donut. And you just need to be dodging these fissures while doing that combination. A big piece of advice I have, a lot of us died on day one to trying to dodge the front or rear AOE and dodge the fissures at the same time while it was a point blank. The point blank is easily the harder of the two things that you need to deal with. And uh, we eventually realized you don't need to get behind or in front of the boss before the point blank or the donut goes off. You can actually do it after, um, even as you know a not dancer. But so you see the, the AOE hits here. If I was stuck in front of the boss, which I actually think somebody is here, um, I actually have enough time to get behind the boss regardless of the position that I'm in because it takes probably another three seconds for that. Now, of course, the timing is tight. If you're somebody who waits till all the animations are gone before you move, I think you're very likely to take the hit and that's that's not good. In fact, I think, did he step? Yeah, our healer who was actually with us, I think the whole time, just steps too far to the right, bam, gets slapped. Now, actually worth seeing that he didn't really take too much, but you get a 15 second dot that really hurts and that's, you don't wanna leave that on your healer. So it's not the end of the world if you do get hit with more gear, that'll become easier, but it's not something you want to happen. And then on top of that, there's a second set of fissures that go off and the sa second safe spot will always be, you know, within, it'll be something that adequately dodges whatever the second mechanic is. So there, like for example, we have the donut AOE here that you can see that we did, um, there were safe spots in the hitbox. So you can guarantee that. Uh, so you don't really need to worry. So as long as you know, point blank dodge, get behind or in front, and then do the opposite and get to the safe spot, it's normally okay. A big thing that happens with the point blank is people don't go far enough and they get clipped. Um, sometimes people get clipped by the fissure explosions because they don't realize, they kind of forget how big they are. But there's diagrams, there's things you can do to help mitigate that. And honestly, just doing it a bunch helps with that experience as well. It's one of those things that getting reps in really, really helps. And then after that is Archaic Demolish, which is light parties. Uh, both the healers will get a four-person split damage AOE. This was in normal mode. The, now it just doesn't have an indicator. So, you know, people probably forgot in the one week and then they're like, ah, oh, yeah, that's from normal mode eventually. Followed by a room-wide AOE. So that's, you know, get into group one, group two, light parties, and then mitt, heal, and then mitt, heal. It's same thing. If you have like 10 second mitt, you can actually hit both hits here. And it's really, really nice. Like faints, reprisals, addles, uh, sambas. Although I probably wouldn't use samba here. I would probably save it for the very next mechanic. Because the next mechanic is the wall. Everyone who has been doing this fight will tell you that Levin kick which is the next mechanic here, is the only mechanic you really need to worry about in the party finder. There are other mechanics that can get the party killed, don't get me wrong, but like this is a hard, like a hard stop for people. So Levin Kick is a full downtime mechanic. You don't have to hit the boss at all, so you can just focus on healing and dodging everything. It summons four Levin Orbs. And what are they actually called? Because I think it shows you on the left. It doesn't actually show you on the left. So um, this is uh, these are four Lightning Orbs. The boss then marks them with numbers one, three, five, and seven. And then what the boss? And then the boss will mark four players: two, four, six, and eight. So what the boss is doing is saying, first I'm going to kick this ball across the room. Then I'm going to jump to and hit the person who is marked next. So he'll kick the one ball, jump to the two person, kick the three ball, jump to the four person until it goes through all eight of the players. And the uh, the even numbered players, the ones that are marked, uh, they actually, their AOE is also um, proximity based. So they need to be very far away from wherever the boss is kicking the ball. So th that kind of just immediately limits the number of ways that you can solve this. But there is one more thing happening here at the same time. 
and the other four unmarked players are going to gradually get these blue markers over their heads. You'll very often hear players call this type of AoE a defamation. This is a reference back to Alexander, the 12th encounter, where uh, you get a marker and then it explodes a few seconds later for a massively sized AoE. If you hear defamations, that's what it means. They're not called that here. You can just call them big AoEs, and that literally serves the same purpose. So the other four players, and I actually am one of those four players here, gets this marker over their head. And at the end of the marker of being over my head, it'll explode, deal a ton of damage. And I just have to make sure I'm near no other player because otherwise it's going to kill somebody. So the easiest rule that we found was to have the defamations here uh, run behind whatever ball is currently being kicked. So the first player who gets marked goes behind the ball marked one. The second player that gets marked goes behind the ball marked three, the third behind the fifth, and the fourth behind the seventh. Now, that's not the only thing that the ball does. The ball gets kicked to the other side, but what actually happens with the ball when it gets there is it hits the opposite wall and explodes. So you can't be on that wall or you're going to die. And then it leaves behind a tower and that tower needs to be soaked by another player. So essentially, there's three different people dealing with an assignment during any given ball kick. During the first ball kick, the first defamation is exploding. One player is taking a tower, and the two player is taking that jump, which you'll actually see the boss jump away right now. That's him, that that rush that he did, he's, he's literally leaping to the player that's marked two. But then you need a player in the tower. So... Again, there's really only one way to solve who needs to do what at any given time. Um, how you solve it is still a little bit up to you. Like as long as the A, the defamation doesn't hit anyone else. B, the two player is far and can, you know, survive and bait the damage away from the party. And somebody gets the tower, then the, the options are open a little bit. Apparently what the party finder is going back and forth between is whether they want to do kind of something similar to what we're doing here or a strat that has a little bit, it has a few less moving parts, but you need to be more aware of where the moving parts are. And I'll describe the difference in strategy here in a little bit. But what we're doing is we're finding the orb opposite of the one, which will always be the five, by the way. And then we're just rotating around the room as a unit while people move out to their spots to do whatever mechanic they have. So you can see somebody else has the defamation over here. So when the boss goes to jump to three, which is this one over here, you're going to see. Now, this person is actually the third marked defamation. So don't get too confused. That's not the same person who we see here who's running off to the side. So the three is over. You can see the ball just got kicked. So we're standing on seven right now and three is across from us. The defamation with the second one ran over there, and then somebody goes in that tower and somebody else gets kicked. It's very, very simple. First defamation, second defamation, third defamation, fourth defamation, goes into the, the orbs, one, three, five, seven, in that order. Makes perfect sense. Um, the person who can take the tower, the only person eligible really is six. The person marked with six by the boss. And then the two is getting jumped on, so they they their assignment is in place. So the callouts here are pretty simple. It's... First defamation, six tower, two bait. Eight tower, four bait. Uh, two tower, six bait. Four tower, eight bait. Those are my call outs throughout this. And the defamations, we just trusted to pay attention just enough. We even lose somebody here and it's it's perfectly fine. Like it doesn't actually end up mattering um, much in the end because they did their correct job. And bam, you can see there it is again. And then as a party, we rotate over here and it's the same thing. The big thing here is that uh, the way we set it up is you see us all running as a party and then people moving out. Um, I like this kind of strategy very often because it kind of acts as like a giant flag to tell people what to do, if that makes sense. When you have a, a mechanic and you do it in a way where everybody kind of goes to set locations and they need to be in a set location or the mechanic kind of fails, then there's a little bit more onus on the individual to focus hard on the spots they need to be and the number of spots they can possibly be. Whereas with this, by the party being in a set spot, it informs every other player what the end result of the current mechanic is going to be. Because with the party all grouped up, you know opposite of them has to be a defamation, behind them is a tower, 
And then to the left or right is the bait. And then it's just about remembering the order of things. So that's two completely different ways of looking at it. And it's why people go back and forth with these kind of strats. People do genuinely find things like this easier versus something like the other strat, which allows you to uh, do a lot less movement. You don't have to run around the arena like this and get into specific spots and constantly move. But it is a full downtime mechanic, so this is what we landed with and this is what we went. So I'll go back and let play Levin Kick through all the way from the beginning and I'll just do what my call outs would be. Find the five marker. We are going counterclockwise. First defamation, out. Six tower, two bait. Second defamation, go. Eight tower, four bait. Two tower, six bait. Watch out. Four tower, eight bait. There you go. Done. That is what a, a, a call out would sound like there. And then after we're all alive and we're sure it's done correct, I would be like, because I did call outs for this, so I know. So I'd be like, okay, we did it correct. Okay, Proteans, clock spots, it'll either be in or out. Get in your pairs. Out pairs. Out pairs. Bam. Done. Raid wide. Mitt, heal. That's just generally how the flow of these things end up going. A lot of the callouts are about getting as precise information out in as few words as possible, but occasionally supplementing your callouts with information, especially if you're in a static. A big thing you have to learn in a static situation is there are people who learn and interpret at different rates and just with different choices of words. Some people like to call where a mechanic is happening and thus you know not to be there. And some people like to be told where the safe spot is. So a lot of the times you'll want to add callouts like that, especially to high execution mechanics like that one. Being able to say, like you could say first tower, second tower, third tower, fourth tower, and that informs the same information because you've set in stone what each of those towers needs to do. But I am not that person. I decide to say, I'm just gonna say six tower, two bait, eight tower, four bait, and just move through the markers because I wanna add that layer of communication. It's not something people should expect. It's not something that every group will do, but it is important to bear those types of call outs in mind. And they also help inform other people about what the pace of the mechanic is, which in my experience does help a lot of people with their learning. So that's actually the big lesson with Levin Kick is that there are a couple of ways to do it, but that the rules are still largely the same. Even if you're not doing the Mario Kart, you just need to learn the movement. And as long as you understand the base elements and the call outs I just gave you, then that'll go a long way. So after that, as far as I'm concerned, the fight is mostly over. Don't get me wrong, this next stuff can easily kill you, and I think it, it killed us more times than I think we wanted to admit. But we didn't actually see, I think we only did like 30-something pulls of this before we killed it. So it obviously didn't do too much. This next mechanic is super easy. So these are Charybdises, and these are just AoEs on the ground. You don't stand in them, you never step in them, and they don't do anything. Comets are proximity AoEs, so everyone stands mid and waits. It's really after the next part where the mechanic even begins. So two of these meteors are cracked and two of these meteors are uncracked. The meteors go through three states. They can be uncracked, which means if they're hit by an AoE, they will become cracked. Then uh, if they're cracked and they're hit by an AoE, they'll then explode and then explode it is the third state. So basically there's going to be mechanics here that have to be baited away from the boss, but you have meteors in these spots. So the idea is to bait attacks onto the meteors that uh, are cracked already because they're weak and they're just not gonna survive the phase. Whereas four other players need to bait conal AoEs towards these winds. So the winds are not only non-threatening, they automatically inform you about where the other four players need to be. So something like this when you're going through prog, if you see mechanics that come in fours, you should automatically assume that there's a reason for that. And in this particular case, we saw this mechanic one time, we saw there were conals, we saw there was an AOE, and that information alone carried us to like just do it the very next pull. So uh, we decided to do um, support uh, supports bait first, DPS out. So that's because the four conal AOEs coming out actually get baited by the four nearest players. 
because the roles are split, four and four, supports being tanks and healers and DPS being DPS, it was easy to make that call. You could do it the other way around. It doesn't matter. You don't lose uptime here anyway, so whatever's more comfortable. But during all this cast of Beastly Bile, this is just alerting you that the next mechanic is going to start. It doesn't actually do anything at the end of the cast. So all four DPS, we make sure we're the four players furthest away, so we're going to bait a shared AoE on us. The other four players line their backs up to these markers. And again, you can use what we call the color buddy system where A and 1 would, you know, both prioritize that as their their kind of conal back spot. And then, you know, 2 and B and 3 and C. Same thing I said before. The other thing is deciding what meteor to go to first. Um, we basically would look north and then go to the first cracked meteor clockwise. So this is the marker at two, if you look at my mini map up here. So, you know, we checked north, looked clockwise, and the very first meteor was cracked. So we went to it as a DPS. And then the supports just go to the other one. So you'll see, bam, they bait those. Now, if those AoEs hit a meteor, they will explode it. So it's very important that people get used to actually aiming these behind them. And uh, and then that's it. As long as both groups do that same thing, then you're fine. Look, when we line up, and there's even lines on the ground. So funnily enough, I didn't even realize this. In this clear, somebody aimed the AOE at the meteor. So if you actually, you know what? That's worth bringing up. If you have a caster, they can do that. If you have like a caster DPS going second, um, they can actually do that. They can just walk forward instead of walking to a set spot. So just a little bad tip. I'm sure black mages in here already knew that. Although honestly, black mages have so much mobility. I don't know if they needed to know that, but um, I don't even think they did it on purpose. I think he was, tr <laughs> he was trying to get to his correct spot because he was in the wrong spot and he just happened to award us that information, <laughs> which makes total sense. You know, there's no reason why you can't aim it at the already broken and exploding meteor. And then the other party, the other light party, dropped it on the four. Now, the last thing that happens here is Ecliptic Meteor. One of the two meteors here will uh, be marked as the center location for a meteor. You need to line of sight that by standing on the other side of the other meteor. So you can see the meteor on three is marked. It has that little like dark marker over its head that's under the title of the video. So we as a whole party go to the other side. I think you can actually be inside of this meteor as long as you are slightly behind it and it's actually okay for the damage here. But just make sure you don't get hit. And then this will explode right afterwards. So you need to step away. And that's it. Look, the boss is at 30 something percent. Beastly Fury is a uh, raid wide if I recall. Honestly, this last part's such a blur because we saw it so few times. I think we saw it like two or three times overall. Um, so then that's it. And then we have, you don't have only one more mechanic. You actually have two more, but realistically the next one, oh no, I'm sorry. No, so the next one's another martialist phase with the knockbacks and the fissures on the ground. It's a little bit different though because it's a combined martialist and mage phase again. It's just, it's using that as the base of the mechanic. So uh, the walls go up. This is the same. You want to take the knockback into the walls with your pair. Uh, does the boss do a tank buster here? It does. Okay, yeah. Uh, actually, no, this is the shared tank. But this is the swapped tank buster where they both take a hit each. So when fire, I thought it was the other one, the one where they, uh, the other thing happens. Then it's archaic rock breaker. So we get into our pairs. You can see we go back into our into our pairs. We take the damage right here. And now we're doing the fissures again. Now, the big thing is the boss is not casting front or rear combination. We are just solving fissures at this moment. And the boss is going to cast dual spell instead. So we need to pay attention to what spells the boss has. In this case, it's fire and ice. And we need to know that as soon as our fissures are resolved, we have to get to a position that resolves that. So... We dodge the first fissure set. We dodge the second fissure set. I highly recommend roughly staying in the area where you would normally do your spreads for this, your pair spreads. And we get fire, which means it's the big outside AOEs. So we very quickly run here. Um, funnily enough, I, again, so this time the healer got, it was the supports that got selected. Uh, they started running in and then back out. They, yeah, the supports got selected and they still didn't kill anyone there. So uh, very, very forgiving AOE sizes on those, just to say. But that can be any number of things. That could have been ice, I believe. I don't think I've ever seen it because I've done the mechanics so a few times, but I'd like to believe it could be lightning. So it could be 
like spreads and uh, in or spreads and out as well. But whatever it is, you just need to be reacting to the dual spell. In my opinion, it's actually a little easier than the first one because I think the front and rear combination followed by the two light parties is actually more threatening than the dual spell at the end. But that's just my personal opinion. And so funny thing, um, Chimeric Succession is next, and it's essentially, it's not really Levin Kick 2, but I think a lot of people call it that. So these four players that are marked, they're each going to get an explosion, and it's basically the defamation from Levin Kick. Uh, we came up with a plan for this, survived doing it wrong, healer LB'd and cleared. <laughs> so our plan here was to send one, two, three, and four to each of the uh, one, two, three, and four markers all the way out at the wall. And then to uh, bait the AOE from the boss onto uh, the, onto that first side. So ours required like two like very specific like sides. And it also did 100. How many people did it hit? It hit, th what, three people for 170? Yeah, see, here's the thing. I haven't looked at like what the actual solution is to these mechanics. But the fact that it did 107. Yeah, though, I don't know. Maybe if we had a fourth person. I wonder if that was distance-based like in the first phase. I'd like to believe it was distance-based. But again, we just, this was us figuring it out and clearing it. And that's another reason why I didn't want to make a guide for week one. A lot more often nowadays, you get these kind of super sloppy week one clears. And then I just need to go looking for people that had ultra clean ones and just get the information from them. Uh, this tier with my limited amount of time, I just didn't want to do all that. So we all died here. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. We all died here. And then the defamations are going off. But the big thing that actually happens is the boss is using front or rear fire strikes. Basically, it will go to the location of one of the unmarked players. <laughs> I have to assume it's one of the unmarked. Or maybe it was me. Maybe it's the nearest player. Who knows? Let's see. Is it to me? Uh, no, it was to the tank, and he was the furthest unmarked player, so, I mean, I'd just like to assume that, that that's who it's going to, but who knows, like this, again, this is where you get to the end of a first or second fight prog, and you actually maybe didn't learn everything all the way through, but you squeaked through for a clear, and that's perfectly fine and perfectly normal for a week one. The problem then becomes, in subsequent weeks, you tend to skip a lot of this stuff. In fact, this was almost skippable with, like, cleaner play already this week. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, kind of crazy. But then what happens is the boss will turn to, uh, I think, the nearest player or whoever the baited player was, which, honestly, if you're doing this correctly, they should all be together anyway. He'll turn to face them after a brief delay and then perform either the front combination or rear combination uh, AOE. So either be the 180 in front or the, under, the 180 behind. So the idea is that if it's the rear fire strikes, you go to the bait location and then just stay still. I'm sorry, no. If it's the rear fire strikes, you go to the location and then run through the boss afterwards to force him to turn around before he starts channeling his next attack. If it's the front fire strikes, you take it to the designated location and leave it facing the outside of the room. I think what's normal for this now is triangle strategy where... The one, two, and three, I think, are all in set locations, but the four moves into the one spot afterwards, I think, is the normal thing to do. Um, feel free to correct me again. I haven't looked at all that stuff. I'm just taking, like, a little bit of word of mouth that I've heard. Um, and it's super easy. Like, it's, this is a freebie mechanic when you look at a proper guide and, and, and just execute on it. It's not very complicated. It doesn't have that many moving parts. So I don't expect anyone to struggle with this. Genuinely, if you get past Levin Kick 1, there's a chance you clear. <laughs> like that's just, that's just kind of the reality of it. And then even look. Now, the main reason why this LB was kind of scary, a two minds goes off here. This is the same thing that was after Levin Kick 1. And this is Lightning and Ice. So this is going to be line AoEs and in. Uh, and as you can see, we all just got healer LB. So we just all stood still. <laughs> we made sure that the two people who didn't have Resin Volm, uh, who were going to survive, they didn't get hit, and then the healer who healer LB3 just died. <laughs> as long as everyone else has the invuln, the, the, the invuln for uh, the, the resurrection, then you're fine. And I think this is back to the very first dual spell. Now, this is something you actually see a lot in this tier. The last 10 to 15% is a repeat of a not super difficult mechanic, but it's basically one last are you paying attention check and one last this is letting you know the end is coming. Like it's literally a set means of the fight being designed to teach you 
that the end of the fight is coming on a given clear. So it's just dual spell, raid-wide AoE. Dual spell, raid-wide AoE. So it's literally the first dual spell just with raid-wide AoEs in between. And that's that's it. That's the end of the fight. After that, I think there's like maybe one more dual spell, one more raid-wide, and then the Enrage. And uh, I, th I both like and dislike that design. I really like when the end of the fight is as stressful as like the midpoint or the beginning. So there's some consistency all the way. But it has an almost ultimate design feel to it where um, in ultimate encounters, the last several percent of a boss's health bar are very commonly uh, given to you as a freebie where you don't have to solve a mechanic. It's literally a race against the clock. That can be the Ock Morns in Yukob. That can be the uh, the Jails in both Uwu and T. Uh, that can be the very last, uh, I think it's Alamorn or Ock Morn. It's like Ock Morn Blade or whatever it's called. And then you also have... Uh, run dynamis in omega there's like this little brief period where the mechanics just get super easy or go away for a, a, a very recognizably large size of the boss's hitbox and at that point it's on you as a raid to just finish the job and that's kind of what they've done here and i don't mind that because there's normally a few more raid wides there's normally a little bit of pressure it's almost like it's trying to take the pressure off of the um the shakies like you know when, oh this is my first time clearing oh my god we're almost there we're almost there your hands start shaking you start playing a little bit less well you know like that's that's a super common thing it feels like it's like an anti shakies design which i'm perfectly okay with because that can be really nerve-wracking and they kind of give you this simpler period of time to just say i'm, I'm killing the boss i'm just this isn't hard i can kill the boss i just need to keep pressing buttons i can kill the boss it, it like it almost becomes a boost in confidence unless someone dies and then it's like how did you die to that we were so close <laughs> it makes the defeat even more crushing on the other side i guess at the end of it but that's P9S, uh, not too bad. Really just Levin Kick 1, and then I think both of the Marshalist phases probably going to cause a tiny bit of issue, but not insurmountable. And otherwise, a pretty solid encounter through and through. I mentioned this in my thoughts video. I think it's on par with other first fights. It's exactly what should be expected of a first fight. Um, a lot of stuff you recognize immediately from normal. A little bit of innovation that makes sure that it's distinct from normal. And, uh, you know, it's the first fight. So the DPS check's not super tight. The, the healing check, the mid check, none of that's like super tight. It's, it's mildly lenient. And I think they kind of nailed that here. So it's good to see a consistently designed, I think well-designed first encounter. Whether or not you like it is going to be down to whether or not you hate or like Levin Kick. In other words, if you party finder, you probably hate this fight. If you have a static, you probably like this fight. So sounds like almost every fight in Final Fantasy XIV, though. Either way, that's it for my thoughts on P9S. I'm going to take a little break and then get working on the P10S thoughts video, which is actually the one I'm most excited to talk about. I, I never thought I'd say that for a second fight, but I cannot wait to talk about that fight. Anyway, that is going to be a wrap. Thank you for watching. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share. And if you're looking forward to Final Fantasy 16 also, be sure to subscribe. We got some stuff coming. Anyway, I'll see you next time. And until then, take care. <laughs>